Well, hello and welcome. My name is Mark Eppner. I'm a Chicago-based pilot with over half of my 2,000 plus hours in a Cirrus SR22. Currently, I fly this 2011 normally aspirated G3, but also fly other aircraft when the opportunity presents itself. I love flying every bit as much as you do and look for ways to share that common bond through multiple paths, including this channel, as well as Simple Flight Radio, which you can find at simpleflight.net. My goal for the channel is to share my passion for aviation with others that share that same sentiment and do so with an eye towards proficiency, safety, and fun. Well, hello and welcome. One of the joys of youth, which left me a long time ago, is there are so many firsts in our lives. If you think back, you know, the first time you saw something, you touched something, you experienced something, it was so cool. And the problem is, as we all know, that as you get older, there really aren't as many firsts. It's tougher to find those first time things. And that's why I love aviation so much, because every flight I take, and I earned my license in 1976, but every flight I take creates that same first time feeling. It's awe, it's wonderment, it's excitement. So on April 26, 2022, a Tuesday, I had three more aviation firsts, and it wasn't just that I went up and it felt like a new flight. And I got to be honest, it wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but it's a first nonetheless, and I want to share it with you today. So the first item that I experienced was this. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Uh, Cirrus 973 Sierra Delta. Engine loss uh, north of Mansfield, uh, circling for uh, off-airport landing. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Red Cirrus 973 Sierra Delta. Uh, engine is uh, gone and landing north of uh, Sierra Delta. This is Skywest 5747. You said 73 Sierra Delta. Where? Uh, how far north of Mansfield? Last calling mayday. Say again. Uh, Cirrus 973 Sierra Delta just had an engine blowout, and uh, I don't know how far north of Mansfield, but I'm landing on a field here. Okay, 73 Sierra Delta, I'll hand it on to ATC Jimmy. 973 uh, Sierra Delta, we'll pass that information as well to ATC. Fly the airplane all the way to the ground. Wilco, coming close to down now. Delta is what I heard. I'm going to let uh, ATC know. 973 Sierra Delta. It was 937. Uh, 973 Sierra Delta. Yep. You're safe. Nice job. Good job. Nicely done. Good job. Atta boy. Yep, you got it. My first Mayday call because it was my first emergency in over 2,300 hours. And it resulted in my first off-airport landing. Pretty scary stuff, at least in my head it was. And as I think about the things that scare me in aviation, an engine out is pretty much near the top of the list. And I suspect for many of you, you got the exact same concern. And to be honest, I assumed I would be paralyzed by fear and possibly not able to successfully execute the procedures that were taught from the start of our flying career. Yet, I gotta tell you, my fear did not come to fruition. Conversely, I had no fear, no indecision, and the tasks that needed to be executed were crystal clear to me, from one to the next, like dominoes falling one after the other. It was really an amazing surprise. And now in the week and a half that has elapsed since that event, I've learned a lot more about the brain and how it operates. And I don't claim to be an expert, but I am optimistic that my experience trends directly to what can happen to you. And in that, and because of that, I think I can help you eliminate the fear that you may share with me about how you will react in an emergency situation. I think at the end of this, you're going to feel better and have more confidence about moving forward in such a situation. So let's go back a couple weeks. And as I drove to the airport on that Tuesday morning, I noted the ceilings were less than forecast. I was heading to the Akron, Ohio area from Chicago. So I spent time prior to departure to think through options of VFR versus IFR, altitudes, terrain considerations, and so on. 
In the end, I decided to start out VFR at 2,500 MSL, which would translate to between 1,500 and 1,900 AGL with unlimited visibility, a nice tailwind, and a smooth ride. I also committed to reevaluating the decision as I progressed along the route. In the spirit of keeping this episode brief, I'll leave out the factors I considered and just state I stayed between 2,500 and 3,000 feet MSL. So as I continued crossing Indiana, it occurred to me that I was at a lower altitude than I normally fly at, and I should think through some of the implications of that. So I play the game that most of us play, which is, what if I lost my engine? What would I do? Yes, I'm in a Cirrus. I didn't think about pulling the chute even then. I looked at the fields below me, and of course I saw a lot of farm fields. This is Indiana after all. And I scanned the fields which had furrows, and some of them ran north and south, and others ran east and west. Well, with the wind out of the west, I said to myself, okay, Mark, you're going to execute a 180-degree turn because you want to land into the wind, and you're going to do so on a field that has the grain, if you will, running east and west. I also scanned for towers, power lines, houses, and then came to a decision, okay, there's the field I would land at. Mission accomplished, and I continued on. Little did I know that about 30 minutes later, I would be called on to make that decision for real. So about 30 minutes later, I was scanning for traffic. There seemed to be a lot of VFR traffic that day. So I had my head on a swivel and it was, I was looking to the right. And as I brought my head back around to look straight forward, I didn't know if I shifted my headset, but I noticed the hum of the engine all, all of a sudden sounded more like a drum roll on a metal drum. I thought to myself, does my engine sound different or did I move my headset somehow? And it was mid-sentence on that that the engine all of a sudden went into distress. Sputtering, no power, almost, and I assume I was hearing a metal-on-metal metal sound. So... I have to admit, I had the, and excuse the expression, the oh shit moment. I don't want to have to go through this. But to my credit, I quickly came back and said, but I don't have a choice. You are going to go through this. It was at that point that I found my hands almost on autopilot, switching tanks, turning the fuel pump on, going to full rich. And of course, in retrospect, I remember this is five months earlier. I was with my CFI who was teaching me commercial maneuvers, which included a simulated engine out. The engine just quit, Mark. What are we going to do? And the chute is not available. I, well, I'm going to pitch for 87. 80, 88 is actually the best glide speed. Take your pick. Make sure you land with the furrows, though. Yeah, so right below my left wing. All right. My plant. Let me see your, uh, where are you going. Down to... That one, that brown one? Yeah. Just to the west of that row of trees? Yeah. Got it. I like it. You're on a high downwind. What do we do next? Can we restart the engine? So I remember it. Three, two, one check. Three things have to do with fuel. Mixture, adjust mixture, fuel pump on, switch tanks. That'll usually get the engine running again. Fuel pump is on? Yep. Good. Two things with spark. We need spark, right? Make sure your mags are on both. Yep. Maybe even cycle them off, then back the boat. Don't do that now. But, yep. And then the one thing with air is alternate air. Select alternate air. That might be the reason your engine quit. Okay, so having done all that, you've done everything you can do to restart the engine. Now it's just a matter of getting the airplane safely on the ground. Right. So now it's all about judging your rate of descent and when you apply the drag. You'd also be going on 121.5, mayday, mayday, mayday. Sierra's three Sierra Delta going down at about 30, 30 miles northwest of O'Hare, or you could say relative to 3CK. So now just fly your airplane. Look, Keep your speed safe by lowering the nose. All right, smoothly go around, add power. Good. That would have made that field beautifully. The most critical thing I think I did that day was immediately go to the 321, even though I was at too low of an altitude. And with metal on metal, there was no chance that I was going to fix the problem. 
But I realized that. I remember I did the three for fuel, and then my brain said, don't go any further. You don't have the time, and it's not going to have any impact. But in my mind, that set up the dominoes of things I had to execute. And it, my brain went back five months ago because then everything was on autopilot, if you will. So I pitched for best glide, and then I pressed the nearest button. Again, realized I don't even know what came up. It was irrelevant. There was no way I was going to glide in the next minute to an airport that was miles away. So I ignored that, and then I scanned for a field. I looked out and immediately saw a field that looked perfect, right? No power lines, no towers. It was right there to my right. It was long and wide. I didn't need to see any more. So I started to turn toward there. I reached up, pressed and held the flip-flop button on the radios, which automatically brings up 121.5 guard, and keyed the mic and repeated exactly what my CFI, Bob, had told me five months earlier. My problem was I didn't know how far north I was from Mansfield, which I've got a solution for that in the future. And as, I, as I'm talking, even you may hear, you may have heard in my first um, playback of that Mayday call, at one point they're asking me a question. And I said, I'm about to touch down. So I was talking to him on short, short final. I don't know if that was smart. But again, my brain was telling me it's relevant. I was hyper-focused on my aiming point on the field. But it, it, somehow it was okay for me to continue to communicate. As I lined up with the small furrows, it wasn't like a deeply plowed field, I dropped full flaps and executed what we all know is a soft field landing. You know, keep the plane off, but don't stall it high. Kind of run out of energy as your mains touch, and it quite honestly worked out exactly like that. There was a lot of other activity, but for, I guess, the purposes of this session, I think that's good enough. I'm happy to answer anyone's questions in the future. But I will tell you the most important thing that came out of this is that the realization of what happened when my good brain, not that the other brain was bad, but the good brain took over. Because what happened is that it pushed that analytical brain, which loves to compare and contrast and make decisions, it pushed it off to the side and basically said, I got this. It put me in a mode, there were no decisions to may, be made. You know, we talk about a field or pull the chute. None of those came to mind. Everything was, there's a makeable field, go there. Didn't even consider the shoot, and I'll tell you why in a second. But there was only steps focused only on execution. Sounds that were relevant, I could hear. But the moment they became irrelevant, my brain silenced them. Sights that were relevant, like, is the propeller spinning? Yes, it is. But as soon as it determined there was no power, I don't recall the propeller spinning. When I approach the ground and the airplane starts yelling, terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up, I only heard it once, maybe the start of a second time, and then my brain shut it off. I didn't hear it anymore, even though I'm sure it was going on. The human brain was good enough and smart enough to shut off distractions and keep me focused only on the things that were important to me. That's really, really cool. And I want you to know that that can happen for you as well. Initially coming out of there, I thought, oh, the brain knows what to do magically. And then as I think about it, it really wasn't coming up with things on its own. It really was just being perfect at bringing up data that I provided it earlier, whether it was months or years ago. And in this case, in my opinion, it remembered and recalled perfectly my lesson from five months ago. So that says to me that we can control this. We can be accountable for making sure we give our brain all the data it will need so that it can help us when we need it. So that means practice with a purpose. Don't just fly to a $100 hamburger. Practice things that are uncomfortable. Fly with a CFI every six months, every three months, every year, whatever, but more than you are now. Use simulator or just in your chair, your easy chair, run through scenarios and picture the muscle memory you need to build. And I think what you'll find is what I find, that the fear will not be in the cockpit. 
the stress and the panic will not be there because you will have given your brain everything it needs to be successful. And again, I want to call it purposeful practice, flying with the CFI, using the sim, running through the scenarios. All of these things contribute to that happening. Now, certainly each of us handles stress and emergencies differently. We're all unique. But I think we can mitigate the negative forces by being proactive and understanding how do your systems work on your airplane? Whether it's a landing gear system, your avionics, know that inside and out. How to handle emergencies. What are the emergency checklists? How are you going to do that? And then build proficiency and confidence through practice that eliminates the fear and replaces it with respect for that which can hurt you. In my experience, fear results in reactive and impulsive decisions, while respect can drive planned and proactive decisions. I know you can do it because I did it. The difference is now we know the recipe for success. So it's up to each of us to put in the practice to build that database so your brain can execute when it needs to. I encourage you to start right now. And until we talk next time, blue skies and tailwinds.